Hello everyone. Today is Friday, December 11th, and this is episode 17 of our Google Hangouts and podcast on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volpe, founder of the Volpe Firm and Nimblevis. Today we have two great guests. First is our tried and true, the Vader of Dater. This is John, and, and I'm not your father, Downey. CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. John, glad to have you back. I'm not your grandfather. <laughs> not your grandfather. Also with us is a uh, longtime listener, Steve Williams, Director, Access Network Planning, Design Operations at Time Warner Cable. Uh, Steve is also a huge supporter of the SCTE, having served as on a number of SCTE chapter and national board positions, and is currently serving on our SCTE board of directors. So, hi, Steve. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, today's show, we're, we're going to cover, cover a number of topics in, in really, as, as normal, no particular order following our typical stochastic process, so it'll just be totally random. Um, but starting off, uh, since we have Steve with us here today, I would, we'd like to uh, ask you, Steve, to share some insight on the SCTE, and I, I think it'd be great for our listeners to have you maybe give us some background and, and your thoughts and recommendations on how our listeners can get more involved with the SCTE. Absolutely, and uh, you know, thanks for SCTE support. Um, I started with SCT about nine years ago as a member of a local chapter, and immediately. Um, started to see the benefits um, to my career. I've been an IP and systems guy my entire career, so I've never put a connector on a on a piece of cable. I've never done any of the field work necessary, so I've learned incredible amounts of how this stuff works beyond the CMTS um, through SCTE. Um, as you mentioned, I this is my second year on the board, and I was very fortunate enough to be elected as the uh, secretary of the board of directors this year, so uh, a little bit more responsibility, but uh, also great to be involved in that group. Um, SCT happenings recently, we've got you know a, a brand new CTO that's just been hired. Uh, was announced, I believe, last week. Uh, he actually starts next week. Is Chris Bastian uh, comes to us from Comcast. Uh, we also have a, a new exciting um, development within SCT. Near, uh, who will be stationed at Cable Labs as part of the SCTE to bring that knowledge from the, the Cable Labs perspective into the training and, and opportunities that we have with SCTE. How, how do you... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead yeah, who was who, who that? Uh, her name is Neem Dang. Okay. Uh, she was recently a Time Warner Cable employee. I know her very well. And she's going to knock that out of the park. And she's going to be located at Cable Labs in Louisville? Uh, yes. Uh, Colorado? That's oh, nice. correct. Good. And and Steve, for our listeners, how do you see the, the sort of the relationship between the SCTE and Cable Labs? What does Cable Labs do, and what does SCTE do in in sort of the what's the differenti differentiation there? Yeah, sure. And there's I think there's been a lot of confusion of that over the years. I think that uh, we've gotten a much better definition of that now, where Cable Labs is you know the scientists. Uh, developing the specifications, working through all the, the various pieces to make something, you know, from a specification and, and qualification um, go, whereas SCTE uh, is now more of an applied science. So we actually take the specs and, and move those and, you know, do the training and stuff on how to make that operational, how to operate that, you know, kind of in the real world. Um, so it's a great, you know, mix between uh, the two, and I think this this position of the visiting engineer being, um, you know, embedded with Cable Labs, um, but being SCTE focused, you know, on how we take that knowledge and those specifications and turning into training opportunities, and the applied science and the, you know, the pieces that, that surround Expo and the other events that that SCTE has. Yeah, and I, so you mentioned Expo, and I think that's when a, when a lot of people think of SCTE, they they're really really familiar with with uh, Expo, but there's so much more to SCTE than just Expo. So I know like you and John were just at a, a one of the SCTE um, local chapter meetings um, the other day, right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's one of the, uh, I mean, really, the, the chapters are the bread and butter of SCTE. Um, that's where the rubber meets the road, and we're able to, you know, bring that uh, training and knowledge from extremely smart folks like yourself who, who have done that, and, and even John, too, you know, going to uh, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're like saying John's smart. Yeah. Yeah. John, yeah. Someone yeah. looks like him. <laughs> he looks so dumb, but he's smart. So he's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the chapter support uh, the chapters you know support the local membership and uh, there's you know 68 chapters I believe, um, including a couple international. There's one in Canada. There's a, a meeting group starting up in in Australia, even and there's some interest in uh, in Germany as well. So you know it really is um, you know where you know, members can can gain that you know great technical training here with uh, you know other members of other MSOs that are in the area, you know, you, you find that you're dealing with the same issues. You know, you might work for MSO1, MSO2, you may work for small MSO3, but you get together and you realize that they're all fighting the same battles. They're all doing the, the same type of work. And I think it's been, you know, very positive to see that type of interaction going on at the chapter meetings. Yeah. So, so I, would, the, hey, I, would, I, I would add that I'm glad to see that the SCT and the local chapters are becoming more in line with today's technology, uh, meaning how to give presentations to a greater audience, meaning WebEx, uh, online offerings. Um, I notice, you know, I've given a lot of presentations, as you, as you have as well, Brady, where you show up and you go out of your way to fly to maybe Kentucky or somewhere in the mid south, the mid Midwest or whatever, and the the advertising doesn't go out to let them know who's coming or the SET local chapter is in a facility that's all Comcast. So the only people that might show up is Comcast and a couple tier two or tier three. And if the local MSO doesn't allow their text to show up, you might have 10 to 20 people, not 30 or 40 people. And so it seems like to hit the masses, uh, it was nice to see the SET is moving in the direction of doing WebExes and online offerings uh, I still like to be on site, as as Steve knows. La yesterday we did this one, the Crystal Coast in uh, Greenville, which is the campus of ECU area, East Carolina. Um, I like to do a lot of whiteboarding, and it's hard to do whiteboarding online, you know. So whenever I'm in front of a, a class, we can stray off a little bit here and there. You know me, I go on a tangent here and there. Uh, but I'll do some whiteboarding. No, I don't do that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> John, it takes 45 minutes to get through the agenda sometimes. On the slide. <laughs> and then I, I fly through the other slides in, in seconds. <laughs> but but it, it is good to see that I think I see more local chapters doing WebEx and online. So, And it, it saves, it's got to save money, too, because to a local chapter having to rent out a hotel room, you know, like a conference room, that's expensive. Uh, a lot of them are fine, like this one we did at Suddenlink, so it wasn't a charge for that because it was a Suddenlink's uh, uh, facility. But I've been at some where they have to rent out like a conference room, and that's got to cost a lot of money. Usually the lunches or meals are supported or sponsored by a local test equipment vendor or, or hardware equipment vendor. Um, but you know, to be able to do these sessions and get good quality presenters uh, that are only doing, say, an hour presentation, it's hard to justify someone flying for a couple hours to do an hour presentation. You got my yeah. point, right? And I so think you got, the online content is really beneficial because there's a lot of systems that are in, in, in rural areas. And so for those technicians, having, having just, you know, to get access to, to, or, you know, to be able to get the ability to travel to uh, one of these events is quite difficult. But if they can can sit down and and attend it from a computer, that's a huge value. And I think also the SCTE has a lot of opportunities from a training standpoint. Steve, you may want to even talk more to that. But for people who are a great distance away from a chapter meeting location or someplace where they can attend some type of um, classroom-based training, it's it's not practical for them. The online is is a tremendous benefit for SCTE members. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. The, the chapter of the year last year uh, was the Alaska chapter, and they ho hold very few, if any, in-person meetings. They're all, because they're so spread out, there's no way they would be able to get a group of people together to, to have that, but they do all of their uh, training sessions 
you know, virtually uh, via online WebEx, you know, go to meeting, wh whatever the, the technology of choice there is. Um, and, you know, it really shows that, you know, the training hours that they're able to get, which is a big part of, you know, the, the point system and how they, they actually became chapter of the year, um, you know, really works to, to their advantage, both from, you know, being chapter of the year, obviously, but from getting the training out to all the folks who are very interested in having that, but unable to, you know, fly four hours across the frozen tundra of Alaska to, to make a meeting. Yeah. So, so if I'm thinking about becoming an SCTE member, you know, maybe I'm not an SCTE member or I'm a new SCTE member and I don't know how to get involved in this training that we're talking about, where do I go? Um, primarily just go to uh, www.scte.org. Um, there is a, a, a registration system there. It's completely free. So you can go in and take a look at the, the different information that's available. Uh, some of the training obviously is tied to members. Uh, you can get a calendar there for upcoming events across the entire uh, country as far as when the events are, where they're located. Um, attend a vendor day, attend a, a technical session that, that's going on. Um, the, the list of regional representatives is right, you know, easily linkable at the front. You know, if you can't find any local information, uh, contact the regional representative because they're aware of all the chapters within their area and can provide that information and contact information. Okay. That's very good. So, um, Steve, anything else you want to cover on, uh, on the SCTE? No, I think that covers uh, everything. Thank you. All right. I, mean, I think Expo next year is what, Philly again? Yeah, we're going to be in Philadelphia next year. So yeah, Expo's in Philly. Um, the the chapter leadership conference is coming up in April in Atlanta. Uh, there's a couple of leadership institute things that SCTE does. There's a Georgia Tech management development program that's available. That's uh, coming up in March, and the Tuck executive leadership program at Dartmouth uh, is coming up in April as well. So uh, all of that information is available on the website. Nice. Okay. Very good. So, um, in in the news, uh, so I did an article. Also, so the Broadband Library magazine. That's also something that's um, available to all. all Absolutely. Yeah, I just members. got my copy today. <laughs> there you go. They just came out. Um, I did an article. Uh, I think this last article I was talking about cord cutting and also focusing, doubling down on Docsis 3.1. Um, you know, I, I kind of focused on uh, a number of things about how how bandwidth, cord cuttings going up and stuff, and uh, that there just seems to be so many different stories about what's going on with cord cutting. Some some people are saying cord cutting is going down. Uh, eMarketer um, just came out and said cord cutting has jumped by 10.9 percent. BGR.com is now saying Apple is abandoning their TV subscription service model because they can't go and just offer 25 to 30 channels is, is what they wanted to doing because content providers are not letting them do that, which is not really a surprise to us. Um, and, and, and then at the same time, the 24-7 uh, Wall Street is saying that Comcast, Viacom, and Time Warner, Steve, are all beating Wall Street uh, earning estimates. So is, you know, is cord cutting really having an impact for that? Now, uh, John and I, uh, Steve, John and I normally just talk about cord cutting from the standpoint that, you know, it, its impact on DOCSIS and stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, the things like how it's, because I, I increased my Netflix sub subscriptions just to see what happened when I stream Ultra HD. It, it gives you about three times the bandwidth increase over their standard HD. Um, it's just curious what your take is from the MSO perspective on cord cutting. Is it impacting business? Is it driving up your DOCSIS throughput? What do you what do you see from that standpoint? So yeah, I, I do see um, you know the, the Kager rates. The you know I forget what Kager stands for right off the top of my head, but it's the oh, annual oh. growth rate, compound annual growth rate. You know those numbers haven't really changed a lot. Um, but obviously it's compounded, so every year we're seeing, you know, these huge growth rates in traffic in general. And, you know, I read the press and, and see all this stuff about, you know, that the, the streaming companies are, you know, well and above the, the, the top uh, data traffic that's on the network, you know, during prime time every evening. Um, you know, is it driving um, specifics for it? I don't think that's driving specifics for us. I mean, we have... Uh, 
goals of doing, you know, IP video, uh, you know, IP delivered video ourselves, you know, not from an over the top perspective. Uh, I think, you know, our recent uh, announcement about the stuff we're doing in New York City, it, you know, kind of plays into that as well. And Comcast is doing the same thing with their X1. Um, it, it's a learning curve, you know, legacy video, qualm based video, which is still a big part of, of uh, all operators' business. You know, it's interesting to see that some like uh, Cable One are saying, you know, we want to get out of the video business and just be a, a bit provider from the DOCSIS perspective. Um, I, I don't see it driving a whole lot of change because we're still seeing the, the, the growth rates in traffic. Whether that's, you know, video, you know, many years ago it was, you know, the delivery of music and every time, you know, there was an iTunes upgrade or a new iPod or a new iPhone came out, um, you know, we would see a, a significant traffic jump there. Um, there'll be another killer app, you know, 4K TV is, is obviously, uh, as you mentioned, quite the, uh, the bandwidth driver. Um, but if it wasn't TV, it'd be something else. Yeah. So, so how about your end, John? Are you seeing any, any new trends or hearing anything new that's driving more bandwidth on your end? No, I mean, we've talked about this before where we know over the top video is adaptive bit rate and it's TCP based, based. So more downstream over the top video is going to drive more upstream acknowledgements. Um, I find that because those flows are not really huge bandwidth consumption flows, you know, even if you do ultra HD, I mean, I don't know if you have any numbers there, Brady, about what you saw. You know, a typical HD channel might have been, because it's MPEG-4, now it might be at H.264 or whatever the compression is. Uh, the HD might be three or four megabit per second. It's not like 19 megabit per second with MPEG-2 or whatever it was. Um, so now we got it compressed enough to be slightly, you know, under five meg, and because the adaptive bit rate is going to be dependent on the screen you're viewing it on, and it's and the type of pipe you have into your house. With that said, even if I go up to ten megabits per second for 4K or ultra or whatever it happens to be. I'm not seeing X suppression from the modem really kick in for a 10 meg flow. Uh, 10 megabit per second downstream might have required 200 kilobit per second upstream, sort of like a worst case for acknowledgments, but 200K is not flooding the modem fast enough to really say, I need to suppress every other ACK. So it's really not kicking in. Now, if I offer an individual house, a residence, 100 megabit per second, and that house has five kids, all doing over the top video of different flows, that's, you know, five times 10 is 50 megabits per second. The modem still isn't doing act suppression because it does act suppression based on the flow, not the total traffic going through the modem. So, I mean, I could see uh, where I'm driving more upstream traffic, and we know that's the case, and it could be um, because of all this extra downstream flows because those downstream flows are like a file, not really a video. And, and Steve and I talked about this yesterday does power boost have a good implication here for over the top video if i have downstream power boost allowing my modem to burst up with more speed for five or six seconds maybe that's enough to fill up the buffer of the video uh the video application for the download of the over the top video so i can start streaming it faster maybe it makes it snappier um so there's talk about you know exploiting power boost uh but then also make sure my upstream pipe is big enough to support all this I obviously have to do more upstream channel bonding, you know, two, three, four upstream channel bonding. If I get the 5 to 85 megahertz, maybe I can do eight channel upstream channel bonding. But um, I, I, I agree with, uh, you know, what you're saying is and the CAGR, the compound angle growth rate, keeps going up, up, and up. And I would always think that if it's 50%, 50% of one meg is only 1.5 meg, so big deal. <laughs> but when you start getting to 10 meg, 50% of 10 meg is 15. And then you get to 100 meg, 50% is, you know, 150. So it's exponential. It just keeps, like, the exponential curve is just going to go skyrocket. So at some point, we, you would think that we would say the kegger can't stay at 50%. It just can't. But it just seems like it has. The last four or five years, even though we've been increasing speeds from 50 to 100 meg, um, we just keep increasing more and more. Maybe it is because of these killer apps, right? Uh, some people are cutting the cord for analog video. Uh, and then they're saying, well, they're cutting the cord for all video and saying, I'll just do over-the-top video. I have a, and I, I said this 
15 years ago, I've been with Cisco for 15 years, and I said this back when I was at WaveTech and even Secor Electronics, cable companies can't afford to be a dumb pipe. You can't afford just to rely on speed alone. You can't be a dumb pipe because now other people are going to offer services over your dumb pipe, and you're going to lose revenue because of those services. And that's why you know Comcast, Time Warner, or stuff are trying to offer their own IP video and over-the-top video and the sticky services, you know, the sticky apps that say, all right, well, yeah, you could get Netflix and Hulu TV, but I can guarantee a quality of experience with my over-the-top video. I don't know, it's my it's my take. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I did have. Um... Yeah, so the pipe's going to keep getting fatter. C c cable keeps, or care keeps going up. The testing that I did, unfortunately, I, I can't do it over a DOCSIS service because uh, I, I, I was just doing it on, on my own residential service, but the buffering for the Ultra HD was enormous on the upfront. We, it was doing, it was pulling about uh, a little over 40, uh, I think 42 megabits per second for the first few seconds in the downstream the upstream TCP was also huge it was it was getting uh, 18 19 megabits per second in the upstream which I was really shocked about so these are all TCP acknowledgments going back um, but that buffering is very short so once once it gets queued up it drops down and and then it'll there's these large spikes so I think what you're talking about as far as uh, making sure that you have a power boost capability. That's really going to improve the experience for the subscriber as well as getting the traffic on and off the network much quicker. Because uh, that buffering speed seems to, from, from at least like a net, Netflix type service, they will do a huge dump to get the data to the, to the end user. In this case, it was a computer um, with a high resolution screen to, to sort of get that data there very quickly but then after that it drops down and then again it'll it, it's very it's sort of very surge oriented rather than a steady stream of data so that, that was yeah. my initial observation it's interesting also it's you could do a power boost on the upstream as well it's just a manipulation of the max upstream traffic burst setting in the CM file so most people assume power boost is just downstream but you could do an upstream power boost as well so you could set up certain settings to get um, maybe the, the doing two channel upstream bonding he signs up for five or ten megabit per second on the upstream you could power boost to 30 or 40 meg on the upstream for maybe three or four seconds based on the CM file so there is ways to you know give that service a different per a perception of speed at least for a few seconds, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that would actually be very beneficial too if we were doing power boost in the upstream. I had not considered that before. So, um, hey, so we we were talking before the um, before the we started the live part of the webinar about sort of incompatibilities or non-compliance of some um, some equipment in the market. I, I don't want to specifically name vendors, but I'm curious um, from the from the MSO perspective. Um, you know, Doxis really got its start um, because we had a lot of pre-Doxis equipment. We had non-compatibilities and stuff like that. Um, Doxis has done a phenomenal job. The specification of standardizing CMTSs and cable modems. We still have some hiccups now and again. We do firmware upgrades to to overcome that. Um, Steve, from the cable operator's perspective, how do you see compatibility between cable modems and CMTSs? Do you um, uh, do you hear a lot of that of being problematic, or do you see do you see that continue to be smooth as as things continue to go on from a, a Doxis standpoint? So I think one of the great things about specifications are um, that there's language in there about should, shall, must, or could, or I don't know the specific terms, but there are things left up to interpretation within some of the specifications. And uh, we, we do see from time to time where uh, one vendor um, tries to, you know, they think they're making it better, and, and it may be making it better in the vacuum that they're in, um, but when everything else is is adhering to a specification and they're deciding to, to go in a different direction, it has caused problems for us. Um, so from my perspective, you know, I, I think that, you know, we, we need to, to maintain those specifications because, as you state, and my first experience with a CMTS was a, you know, a Moto CDLP system. Um, and there just wasn't a lot of uh, of growth on that platform because everybody was doing 
different things. You know, there was the Toshibas of the world, and and uh, and you know, even those folks out there doing Dow Return back in the day. Um, so that was fun stuff. Fortunately, I never had to uh, to deal with that. But yeah, the, the growth of this industry has been on the back of the docs specification, and and from my perspective, we need to 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 maintain that, and everything that says shall shall be included. Yeah, <laughs> I, I always I always thought it was yeah, yeah. I always thought it was you know the running or the the running joke was uh, that's the beauty of standards. There's so many of them. <laughs> 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 it's, yeah, but I agree. I mean, there's a lot of verbiage in there that shall, should, must, may. Um, so you can interpret it different ways, and um, you have a lot of people interpreting it one way versus another. But, I mean, it is the beauty of Cable Labs also, right, their interoperability. Uh, we were involved in a Docsis 3.1 interop, and it, they still have more interops going on. So Docsis 3.1 interop is going to help with, you know, not just cable modem and CMTS, but test vendors and also data. We even had an interrupt with some of the, uh, what do you call it, the traffic the traffic generators. So I mean, this is all the stuff that has to work together, so making sure that we interrupt properly is a, is a good thing. Uh, and then, you know, Doxis has come a long way, but it's also, what is it now, 25 years old? 20 years old? At least yeah, 20, you know, right? I actually did a slide the other day, and I, I think it was like 18 or 19 years of Doxis because but from, from when the first CMTS came out, the spec started before that. So yeah. if you start from the beginning of the spec, it, it's going to be a little over 20 years. But I think when the first, I think it was a Cisco 7246 was the first one out. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. It's coming up on 20 years. But, I mean, it's... Um, it's funny you, you bring up interoperability and stuff like that. And I think part of it is, and I, I know what you're alluding to, is sometimes uh, as a CMTS vendor who I work for, Cisco, you, we implement, say, a feature that's not even part of the spec, but it's a nice feature to have. Like, for instance, ingress cancellation from the chipset. That was never really part of the spec for ingress cancellation. It just kind of, we got it as a nice feature from, say, Broadcom or TI. Um, and it's always been there, but it wasn't in the original spec to have a must for ingress cancellation. Yeah, but um, a, what a wonderful feature that is to have now, especially exactly. when you have some type of ingress, which we always have in the return somewhere. I agree. And the thing is, and you implement a feature, and you provide it to the industry, and they start relying on it, and then maybe that then becomes part of the spec. Like, uh, for instance, we talked about... Uh, we, Cisco has something called CBT, Cisco Broadband Troubleshooter, where you can look at the upstream spectrum analysis. That was never really part of the spec as well, right? But I think, as you told, you know, you, we've talked about this, the, it's now part of the 3.1 spec. Is that yes. right? Yes, yeah, Section 9 of the DOCSIS 3.15 specification, that's, that all falls under the PNM, Proactive Network Maintenance Umbrella, that every CMTS has to support upstream spectrum analysis. And every cable modem also has to support downstream spectrum analysis. So yeah, you it we're gonna we're gonna rely on that absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a great I mean, even, thing to have. Yeah, of course. I mean, even we had a it was a patent pending. I don't think it ever got the patent. And it's just had something called flap list, and everyone loved the flap list. It was basically looking at upstream issues, station maintenance issues, power level issues, uh, and it basically looked at the station maintenance first of all the cable modems. It put them in some type of triage, or, you know put them in buckets to say this, all these modems are power level issues, all these modems are upstream noise issues, whatever. Uh, but that now, I think, is being rebranded in the 3.0 spec as DR di modem diagnostic log. Does that sound right? MDL? I'm pretty sure the flat list is part of the spec, but they've rebranded it as some other name. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize they rebranded it as a name. I, I still use the flap list. So, <laughs> and and I think a lot of other uh, other vendors have adopted that. You can still yeah. still see it as flap list. Yep. yep. Yeah, everybody has that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the flap list. Extremely <laughs> valuable. Right? I know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if and if you're if you're a user of CMTSs and you're not using flap list or if it's, if it has been rebranded. Uh, Please use the flap list command. Show cable modem flap list. That is a hugely powerful uh, command on the CMTS. And Steve, one of your guys that uh, I think is in Syracuse now, he was down in uh, I think South Carolina. You know, maybe not. I'm talking about. He was a big proponent of the flap list. He would clear it out every day, let it build up over 24 hours, and then look at the big mo the big list of modems with the biggest problems and send out his text 
based on that slap list, like every single day. Yeah, I mean, really, if you want to look at it, that's probably some of the earliest origins of PNM by collating that data and and matching it to the plant and determining where somebody needed to go work on something. Now it was a great system. I mean, it wasn't a great system because it was running on an access database, and it was, you know, the the one of the biggest kludges I've ever seen from that perspective. But the data was was solid, and and they had, they had a whole program around it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times I'll have a, a, a customer call me and they're having problems with a particular cable modem at a subscriber location and they're trying to figure out is it an RF issue or not an RF issue. You can quickly look at the flap list and if that modem has lots of flaps, you're going to know it's probably an RF issue. Uh, if, so it's it's a quick way to, to, to start a basic troubleshooting routine based on the flap list. If it, and especially for operators who don't have a lot of internal diagnostic tools or if you don't have access to those diagnostic tools, especially if you're like a, maybe a CMTS engineer and they're pointing the finger at you and saying it's a CMTS problem, you can pull up that flap list pretty quickly and say, I don't think it's a CMTS problem. So I can't speak for the vendor side. I can speak from the MSO side and that it's always a CMTS problem until proven <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> It's easier to deal with one piece of equipment versus millions of pieces of equipment. <laughs> Steve, that's awesome. I, you know, it's really good to have that point of view on here because uh, <laughs> it's always an RF problem. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Well, that's what we say from CNL. It's an RF problem. Uh, yes. So... Um, so cutting into the mailbag here, um, we have actually a lot of questions. I don't know, is there any particular, I know you guys have seen the list of questions, is there any particular one that you found interesting you wanted to dig into first? You might as well cover the one about um, excluding certain test equipment. Yeah, or so... why would you exclude t test equipment from certain features? Yeah, so I think, was that from Kevin? We, so, so basically the, the question was, um, we've had... Uh, we've talked a lot about proactive network maintenance, enabling pre-equalization on the CMTS. So you turn on pre-equalization, that turns on the pre-equalizer in the cable modems. It's going to turn it on for all cable modems, anything that has that pre-equalizer in it. And some of the guidance we've, we've recommended before is, you know, maybe we want to exclude some devices, specifically test equipment. And, and so um, one of the questions that came in from, from one of our listeners is, well, why would you want to exclude test equipment from the pre-equalizer? And that's basically going to turn off the pre-equalizer and the test equipment. I'll, I'll let you guys maybe discuss that back and forth as to why we'd, we would actually do that. I mean, Steve, do you guys do that at, at Time Warner now? Do you know of? Not the pre-equalization, we don't. We have done, obviously, low balance exclusion. Um, due to problems with uh, with certain devices that don't do that, um, and specifically on the test equipment, if somebody's running, say, a DOCSIS 2.0 speed test, you know, against a specific frequency, and the CMTS sees, hey, this modem is is jacking up on this one, I need to move it over here, right in the middle of the speed test, that kind of, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. defeats the purpose of that speed test. Um, we've actually asked equipment vendors to put in, you know, capabilities within their equipment to disregard um, like DCC commands for example so that we don't have to put those in the exclude list on all the CMTS it just would disregard that if it sees the DCC command come in from the CMTS it would just disregard it I think you could probably do the same thing with equalizers and and you know BPI and other things as well yeah yeah I, I agree I mean uh, load balance was a big one for me at first when RF techs would go out and try to lock on a primary channel and then they'd be looking at it and say let me get the MER and the BER and the constellation of my downstream then all of a sudden the CMTS was telling the downstream to move because that modem was doing modem count load balance um, so it was better to tell them up front you know maybe set that MAC address or the OUI or of the test equipment and exclude it in the CMTS so it doesn't become part of load balancing uh, and then I think, Brady, you even had some uh, a patent listed uh, that could take that a step further where you exclude it from load balancing, but the test equipment, you could hit a couple of buttons and move to another downstream on its own. Is yeah, that right? so, so what we would get is the we would display on the UI of the test meter that the, the test meter received the DCC. Did we want to accept the DCC and move, or did we want to override it? And And then at that point, we could either stay in the channel or we could... We could move to the channel that was we were asked to move, 
Um, so that was that. Yeah, that was that's that was the the patent that we had. Um, did so, it all, did it also include a way to move without a DCC being sent? Yeah. So, like, so, so once we got the DCC at that point, we the DCC would tell us here's the channel we want you to move to. Um, we would also have a list of all the active down downstreams that we had, so we could just say, oh, okay, now now we know them. We could move to a different downstream. We could move to the deep the downstream the CMTS one of this two, or we could stay there. So we had we had a number of options at that point. Um, we we could also even when we came online and registered, we could if we didn't want to stay on the downstream we had. You, you always get the list of all downstreams when you come online. So we could we could move to a specific downstream. That's when we're operating in Doxis two mode. Um, yeah. If you're operating in Doxis three mode, the, obviously you're you're bonded to all all downstream so you didn't have a choice at that point so you had to determine when in the test meter if you wanted to operate as a DOCSIS 2 modem where you're just operating on a single downstream or a DOCSIS 3 modem where you're using all downstreams. But you could take that same philosophy and say well let's apply it to DBC so if there's 16 downstreams and the test equipment has 8 channel bonding capability it could end up low bouncing between two groups of 8. Right. So you might say well let's, let's take this and um, and migrate it to DBC, not just not just dynamic channel change for 2.0 modem, but dynamic bonding change for 3.0 modems, right? Yeah, so that would be a new patent that someone could do. <laughs> when I did my patent, we, did, we didn't have, uh, we only had, uh, four, I think, four or eight downstream channels. So, it's <laughs> <laughs> so the other one was, um, for me, test equipment is to try to find physical layer problems. And if your test equipment is masking those problems, uh, then how are you going to find the problem or at least, you know, document it? The, the cable modems are masking the problems to make the service better for the end customer. But we use PNM to find out how much masking the modems are really doing, right? Yeah, the pre-equalizer. Actually, yeah. it's the pre-equalizer that is masking the problem yeah. in the cable modem. So if we, if we disable that in a test equipment, we're going to see a much worse upstream than Correct. what the cable modem is reporting. So the, the bad thing is, what if it's so bad that the test equipment doesn't even lock on? Yeah. Because <laughs> so, we do pre-equalization during initial maintenance as well. Yep. And that, that's the downside of it. So the ideal piece of test equipment <laughs> would be one that came on with pre-equalization on, but could show us pre-equalization on and pre-equalization off. It, it, it would be able to show us sort of a, a before and after picture. Uh, so that would be a really, really nice feature if test equipment vendors started to build that into their modem and could show us the before and well, after, at, the idea. At, at one time, I think Trilithic was looking at uh, two cable modems in the test equipment, and they were asking me, well, what do you think is any type of application? I said, maybe you could have one of the MAC addresses with VEQ and one of the MAC addresses without, and I could register with one or the other or both of them at the same time. Yeah. So the test equipment yeah, that, that would be a good code. use for it. It'd be expensive though, because you have to pay yeah. for two cable modems in it. <laughs> oh, those <laughs> things are cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. And and Steve brought up BPI plus. I mean, if you need to sniff Doxis packets and the traffic is encrypted with BPI plus, basically you can't hook up a wire shark to the Ethernet port or anything like that if it's encrypted and, and try to decode it. Um, we have our own stuff in the CMTS called Cable Monitor to do some of that, but the CMTS is doing the BPI plus, so the CMTS knows how to decrypt it. But Wireshark, external to the CMTS, doesn't know how to decrypt BPI plus. So there might be cases where you have to exclude the test equipment or cable modem from BPI plus so that you can watch it try to register and capture the package to see why it's not registering properly. Right? I mean, it might be getting stuck in a NIT D or whatever. Right. Especially with new modems, right? Docs 3.1 modems coming out. The beauty of standards, right? <laughs> so, yeah, many yeah. Standards, so many of them. <laughs> All right. So, question from Phil. We know the starting power for Docs 3.0 cable modem initial ranging is 23 dBmV, which actually I, I just want to mention 23 dBmV for a Docs 3 cable modem. That's the lowest transmit power it'll do. Docs 2 cable modem is 8 dBmV. So, you always have to keep that in mind. That's a really, really big difference. 8 dBmV for a DOCSIS 2 cable modem, minimum transmit power. 23 dBmV for a DOCSIS 3 cable modem, minimum transmit power. Let, let's, let's add on to that. That minimum is dictated by 
um, if it's SCDMA or ATDMA, channel width, and I think maybe modulation. So that minimum is dictated by some other parameters there. It's not just set in stone 23. Yeah. Like, like for instance, I, I looked this up before because this happened to us in a lab. In a lab, typically you don't have enough padding to force the modem to transmit very high, and the modems wouldn't come online. And we're like, why won't the modem come online? Well, according to SCDMA, certain channel width, modulation, all the other stuff, the minimum was 40. 40 dBmV was the minimum. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. I'm like, and basically in a lab, you just throw more padding on the low side of the diplex filter and force it to transmit hotter, and it was fine. But a lot of the lab guys thought, ah, like a 2.0 modem, it could register at 22, 20, 19, 18, and it's not something you should be doing. You should, even in a lab, you should get modems to transmit between 40 and 50 to look like a real cable plant. Completely agree. But what you, what you should be doing and what actually happens in real life are two different things. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I have seen modems, Doxus 3 modems, that won't come online because they're, they're already at, at below 23, but they're trying, and, and yeah. they can't go any lower. Um, but the Doxus 2 modems were coming on because they're down transmitting at 20 dBmV. And, and so we're trying to figure out why aren't the 3.0 modems coming online. Well, it's, they won't go any lower. So. That's a CMTS problem, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the call the, that we get. It's not the plan. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what makes it even worse is if you're in a lab, uh, I call it a six-foot plant, and you will let a modem come online at, say, even if it's legal, 26 dBmV, and it comes online, that modem still has over 30 dB of range left in his, his output power, meaning if he goes in la-la land, and starts ranging up higher, he's going to hit the CMT, CMTS port 30 dB higher than what he really needs to and possibly affect other devices or port-to-port -port isolation on combiners and splitters and affect another port on the CMTS. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, you, we, <laughs> we should have the modems, if we can, transmit between, say, 40 and 50, type bell curve, and, and then we wouldn't have these issues. So now, do we know what the CM starting power for DOCSIS 3.1 modem is? So that was the ulti ultimate question yes. <laughs> from all this? <laughs> uh, aye, 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 I don't know. I heard, looking at the spec myself, I'm trying to decipher it, um, that when we look at DOCSIS 2.0, 64 QAM, the highest output is 54 dBmV, right, for yeah. DOCSIS 2.0. When we go to DOCSIS 3.0, 64 QAM, it added 3 dB for a single channel, meaning it went to 57. When you do two-channel bonding, it drops to 54. Four-channel bonding drops to 51. From that spec, if you look at 3.1, I believe 3.1, will, for the same apples-to-apples -apples, uh, bandwidth consideration, it's about 2 dB or so higher power level. But DOCSIS 3.0 added an ECR to make the 3.0 3 to 6 dB higher already. So i got to hope that the 3.1 spec is sort of including the, the 3.0 ECR for higher power level, but I'm still up in the air about what's happening with Right, the but that's a max thing. transmit. That's I, 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 didn't, I didn't see what it was for the minimum transmit power, and I was looking through the, the spec for the cable modem registration. I, I didn't see that defined in there. And um, so I, I was curious if, if, if I was hoping you knew, uh, or maybe Steve. But, uh. <laughs> and, and, now that you, and now that you say it, because I knew OFDMA is sort of like SCDMA, not quite, um, but I got to wonder if it will be like SCDMA where the minimum is actually more, higher minimum, when we have higher modulation schemes uh, and a bigger, you know, block. The, the biggest block is 96 megahertz, but no one's going to do that because they don't have the spectrum for it. But they'll probably do like blocks of six or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'll have to look that one up and figure it out. I'll let you know in the next Google Hangout. Yeah, okay, that's that's your that's your uh, homework. Homework. Item. <laughs> <laughs> I just so happen to know somebody who is now a visiting engineer at Cable Lab, so I'll put in a call as well. We'll see if our answers match, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that should be something we can find out pretty uh, pretty easily from a, a a a live test. So that would be good to know. Um, so um, from Nikesh, 
Uh, he has a question. They've installed a, a new Cisco 10K CMTS. So John, you should be able to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> I should be able to they put me on the spot. <laughs> the problem is they have a few other modems on the CMTS. They're getting 50 megabits per second speed, um, uh, but zero on the download speed. So they checked SNR, power-related parameters. All parameters are fine. We're getting lost when they ping the modems from the CMTS. Um, so they're they're looking for advice on the download speed and upload. They're getting 50 megs on a download and zero megabits per second on the upload speed. Um, so they're they're curious, you know, what are what are best practices when you're getting good speed in one direction and bad speed in the up in the upload? But it sounds like they're getting no speed on the upload. <laughs> well, <laughs> it yes. sounds like they're getting nothing. <laughs> Not as bad as nothing. Um, but yeah, zero would definitely be following the bad so, category. So I gotta wonder, and we've talked about this before. Their mod profile is probably QPSK for the station maintenance, so it's probably staying online. It probably has subpar MER. It's probably staying online because the QPSK is so robust. But then the I, I would guarantee it's Q, is not working. I, I would guarantee it's QPSK in the upstream because they're they're saying their SNR in the upstream is between 15 and 18 dB. <laughs> there you go. I mean, right there, you're not going to get any 64 qualm upstream traffic. So they're they probably need to drop their total modulation. They got to clean their plant, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and it might be they don't have pre-EQ on. Yeah. Maybe the pre-EQ is not on. It has micro reflection and group delay. They just turn on pre-EQ. The modem gets better MER, and now it works fine. Uh, but I bet you it's staying online to allow downstream traffic to work because the upstream station maintenance at QPSK is keeping it online. But you're not going to get any 16 qualm or 64 qualm data to work at 17 dB MER. Yeah, and so what you're saying is the, the station maintenance is QPSK. It's staying online. They think the modem's happy, but they might be trying to transmit data at 16 qualm. And if yeah. their MER, if their upstream MER is between 15 and 18 dB, um, no data at 16 yeah. qualm is going to pass through. It's, it is going to be zero. You know, yeah, yeah, they're ironic. Really getting something through because they're getting results from a speed test, so yeah. there's probably significant packet loss and, and yeah. FEC errors and all kinds of fun stuff there. Yeah, yeah. and we, we don't know what kind of speed. They could be doing a UDP-based based speed test. So that the UDP is doesn't require acknowledgments in the upstream. TCP acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah, TCP you still got to be able to click that button to say start. The yeah, test. yeah. <laughs> That's got to get <laughs> Some, to the server. Somehow the mouse click is getting through. Mm -hmm. So, so what's funny? I saw the same situation before, and what happened is eventually modem gets reject PK because eventually it has to redo its BPI plus, and it gets to do the BPI plus. It has to have upstream traffic, and if the upstream traffic's not working at all because the MER is so low, then eventually it'll get reject PK. So it will get rejected uh, security. Okay. So yeah. they might they might keep an eye on that and see if a lot of modems are getting reject PK and it turns out it has nothing to do with the date, the time, the calendar settings. Uh, it turns out that it's not really getting upstream traffic. You would think the customers would be complaining a lot, a lot sooner anyway, right? Because they'd have no upstream traffic if MER is that bad. Okay, so so last question we'll do, and we'll, we'll focus this one on on uh, Steve here. So, what are the top three rec best sort of best practices uh, that we would get for maintaining a uh, a cable plant from from sort of the MSO perspective? <laughs> uh, use PNM, you know, look for your for your data there. I mean, you know, my my role has always been, you know, from an IP perspective and the CMTS perspective. Um, so I, I can't really speak a whole lot to maintaining the plant. Um, so my take, and I told you this before, uh, typically we run the most advanced piece of equipment in the service delivery platform. Um, so our guys have to know a lot about everything. Um, so when it is pointed, you know, this is, that's a CMTS problem. Um, you have to be able to understand that uh, you know a lot of these applications out, that are out there, you know, have a lots of other requirements, and you know the 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 CMTS does a complex piece of that, um, but it, it's not always the root of the problem. So use the tools that are available. I know you know most most MSOs have uh, OSS teams that that create that stuff. You know, take a good hard look at that. Look at the specifications to make sure that the the red, green, yellow stuff that's on some of those tools, you know, is real world based on the specifications that we've been talking about. Um, so that's really you know from my perspective. You know, I, again, I, I've never 
turned a wrench in the plant, so I can't really speak to, to what goes on out there. All right. Thanks, Steve. But I, I want to make sure that you know that your coworkers have a recording now of you saying the CMTS is not always the problem. John, <laughs> I what, think what, it's hardly ever the problem, to be honest. <laughs> He'll prove it. In it. <laughs> exactly. John, what are your thoughts? What are you know your? Uh, and I, I know I know Steve won't um, touch this subject because he can't, but you and I can touch it because we're impartial here, and that's uh, the the because it's in the news. Is Charter going to buy Time Warner and Bright House? Well, they're trying to, right? Uh, I think the good news there is Charter already has a very good PNM application, uh, the Node Slayer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it actually works pretty well. You and I know, you know, the guys that work on that quite a bit, um, and and they've been doing a lot of. They're pushing as hard on PNM as Comcast is with yes, their absolutely. Lighthouse project and the uh, 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 what do they call the what is it called? Scout Flux. Scout Flux. Scout, Scout Flux. Comcast. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah. the Comcast PNM solution. So, awesome. So I think, uh, you know, in regards, if, if the charter uh, acquisition goes through of Time Warner and Bright House, uh, they'll be able to leverage the Node Slayer stuff, um, which should help quite a bit in narrowing down potential issues. And I thought it was uh, some cool demonstrations at the SAT Expo this year. You know, on how to exploit PNM and the pre-equalization taps, and not just the pre-EQ taps, but how the pre-EQ taps fluctuate over time for specific modems. So, I mean, that's uh, we're always finding new ways to interpret the data, right? And it's the more devices we have out in the field, the more visibility we have, the more test equipment and devices. Um, we talked about path track. Path track is going to have to reinvent themselves for remote FI. Because if there is just gigabit Ethernet going from the head end out to the node, well, remote or path track is RF connectors. <laughs> you need to yeah. put that RF connection into the field somehow. Uh, so they're going to be able to do the same SNMP type of stuff that we do with our uh, upstream uh, spectrum management stuff. Right. They're going to have to pull the same MIBs and then be able to do stuff with those MIBs. It's just where we are, right? I mean, it's 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 Docs just keeps reinventing itself, and and we keep uh, keep our jobs for another five years. Yes, yes, it's a lot <laughs> of fun. Yeah. All right. Any closing thoughts, gentlemen? Other than uh, Steve, I see you have the uh, Star Wars uh, icon up, so or I think a lot of us are looking forward to the new movie coming out uh, on the 18th. Yeah, well, in this group, I do consider myself a Doxus Padawan, so I'll just close with, these are not the oids you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very well put. <laughs> a, a, packet is, a packet is not what Doxus makes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yoda. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, thanks so much for your time. Uh, happy Friday, enjoy the weekend, have a great holidays, and happy new year. All right, talk to you all later. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> we'll see you.